is my favorite author. And actually, they used to joke about it in St. Louis because I had to write a master's thesis. And I wrote my master's thesis about Flannery O'Connor. So all the brothers started referring to her as my spiritual girlfriend because I was sitting like every night, you know, reading her work and, you know, so it was, it was you know, we have a good bond there, even though she's gone to God. Did it, has anyone heard, heard of Flannery O'Connor before? Oh, okay, great, yeah. She's wonderful. So I thought I'd, I'd actually begin tonight by reading a prayer that I adapted from her personal journal, which I now his own. own. And actually, Flannery O'Connor was knowing, or she knew that I was reading her journal. I'm sure she would really blush and get pissed off at me, but, you know, what can you do? It's for the greater glory of God, right? So, let's begin in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Dear God, I cannot love thee the way I want to. You are the slim crescent of a moon that I see, and I am the earth's shadow that keeps me from seeing you. What I am afraid of, dear God, is that my self-shadow will grow so large that it will block the whole moon. Instead, I want to love. God, please make my mind clear. Please make it clean. Please help me to get down under things and find where you are. Give me the grace to see the bareness of the places where you, where you are not. And help me to feel that I will give up every earthly thing to find you. Amen. So, now someone told me that tonight in Indianapolis, Archbishop Tobin is also doing a theology on tap. So, if you now know this information and you decide to leave, I won't be offended. Just quietly leave by the back door. And, uh, but no, it's great to be here. And um, I'm kind of basing this talk off of my own work on Flannery O'Connor, but also on this idea of beauty and ugliness. Now, the title of the talk tonight is, is a question. It is, uh, were the saints ever ugly? I know it's a very provocative title. To be honest, Ali emailed me about a month ago, and she's like, Jude, what's it, what should you talk about? What are you going to talk about? And I didn't know, so I just said, oh, this. And then later on, I'm like, oh, what am I going to talk about? I don't know how I'm going to talk about that for 45 minutes. You know. So, but anyway, I thought, okay, I might as well give it a shot. But this whole idea of ugliness and beauty is actually a, a very important theological idea. You know, beauty and ugliness are things that we have in our reality, but also things that I think have implications for our relationship to God. And I was even reading um, the, the lives of the saints, and I, was, I came across a passage that described what St. Dominic looked like. It was written by a sister, and she was, it was basically in the process of making St. Dominic a saint, and they, they took her letter, and they, you know, they gave it as evidence to his holiness. And so I was going to read to you what Sister Cecilia said about St. Dominic. And it will kind of give us a better picture of where the saints ever ugly. And keep and when, you're, when you're reading this, just kind of picture what he might look like. You know, just kind of, whatever I say, just kind of imagine it and see if it's something you would recognize. She said, St. Dominic's figure was supple. His face was handsome and somewhat ruddy. His hair and beard were reddish tinged. He was not a bit bald. I can't say that. <laughs> Though here and there he had touches of gray in his hair. From his brow and his eyes there came a radiant splendor, which won the respect and admiration of all. His eyes were large and beautiful. His hands were long and handsome, and his voice powerful and sonorous. And he was always joyous and smiling, except when moved with compassion at the affliction of his neighbors. I was trying to think of myself, but I don't really match up to him as much. And I think that St. Dominic, he was clearly, he sounds like a very handsome man, you know, like a George Clooney type, right? And I think that very often when we think of the saints, we think of them as very beautiful people. You know, they were saints, so obviously they had something right in their life. And also in our, in our icons, in our pictures of them, in our stories, they always are depicted as these heroic people, these heroic men and women that are able to, to do anything to kind of win over anybody's hearts. And then I also read again, there's a Franciscan soon to be here. Here's a description of St. Francis. And it's from one of his brothers. The brother's name was Thomas of Solano. And he says that on his face, his face was gay and kindly. He was of middling stature, rather small. His head of moderate size and round. 
good to have a round head. <laughs> His face was rather long and narrow. The forehead was smooth and low. The black eyes of small size, friendly and candid. The hair dark, the nose regular. The ears close to the head and small. The temples smooth. Is this, ladies, is this your dream day right now? This right? His teeth were white, <laughs> and they were surrounded by his gently rounded lips. No, oh, perfect. Exactly. <laughs> his hands were delicate, with long fingers. His spare, fragile body was, was frail, but it was covered with a rough gown. And I think that, you know, again, St. Francis, you know, it's kind of an unusual description, but St. Francis is described as this very, you know, appealing person. He was a person who was happy and joyful. He was someone that people were attracted to, that people could follow. And very often, I think, in our saints, they had that quality in them that they could draw other people. They could really lead other people and even give hope to other people. Now, I actually, I tried to look up the description of some of the female saints in our church, you know, like St. Catherine of Siena or St. Teresa of Avila. But very often, all of the, the biographies say they were pretty but they try not to be pretty. In many ways, they were very pretty, pretty women, they were beautiful, but they didn't want to kind of give that side of themselves. They wanted to dress mildly. They didn't want to you know, attract people by their beauty. They wanted to attract people by their life. And so there's not too many descriptions of women say this. But why am I mentioning all this beauty? Well, I think beauty is one of those things that, as I said before, is an ancient part of our church. You know, the uh, pseudo Dionysius, who was an early church father who lived in the 300s, he talks about how beauty is one of the ways that we can know God. And he says that God is this super essential beauty, that God is the beauty above all beauties, and that when we behold, when we see beauty in this world, we're only looking at a part of the beauty of God. And, and even St. Augustine, I'm sure you've all heard of St. Augustine. He talks about his own life, how beauty was the thing that, that very often led him in his younger life. You know, he was always attracted to beautiful women. He was attracted to beautiful poetry. He made his life based around things that he thought were beautiful. And that was what drew him. And then later on, when he converts, he says that it was this beauty in the world that eventually led him to the beauty of God. And that's really how God won his heart over. He used the, the maybe imperfect impulses of his youth to draw him closer to God. And even, you know, Father Barron, I don't know if you've heard of Father Barron, he's a priest in Chicago, and he has a, a blog called Word on Fire. And he's very influential because he uses beauty as a way to evangelize. He made a series of films called Catholicism. Some of you have probably seen it. Where he goes around the world and he films, you know, St. Peter's Basilica, or he films, you know, St. Mary Majora, or he goes to... It's Jerusalem, and he films the, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. He, he films the different places that the Lord lived in. And he shows the beauty of the, the church, the beauty of the buildings, the beauty of the arts and the music and the history. And in his mind, he's trying to evangelize this beauty. Because, you know, who doesn't go to St. Peter's Basilica and walk in and look up and see this beautiful church and feel like there's something more to life? Or who isn't, you know, doesn't behold, you know, a beautiful painting and think, and their hearts are drawn to it. And so beauty, I think, is a very important thing. But there's also a problem with beauty, right? You know, beauty is not something that everyone necessarily agrees upon. You know, I might think that, you know, um, Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son is beautiful, but Nick might think it's just it's silly looking, and you know, he'd rather look at, you know, cartoon drawings or something. <laughs> you know, we would have different perceptions of what beauty is. I know Nick from Purdue. I can tease him as much as I want. And even beauty can kind of be, um, can be dece deceitful. You know, beauty is not something that necessarily leads us to know God, right? You know, just because a person is beautiful doesn't mean they're a good person. Just because a thing is beautiful doesn't make it a good thing. Very often, beauty can be misleading in their own lives. Uh, I even think, you know, in the scriptures, there's a lot of examples of angels appearing. You know, angels appear to Mary, they appear to Daniel, they appear to Moses and Elijah. And rather than being these beautiful specters of light, when the angel appears to Mary, he says,
says, be not afraid, Mary. The first reaction that, that Mary might have is to fear this, this divine visage because the angel is just this creature that is beyond explanation. And rather than being drawn by beauty, she's drawn, or maybe even afraid. Versus when we see maybe in times of scripture when there's temptation occurring, even think of the apple in Adam and Eve's story. You know, Satan isn't, of course, snakes are kind of creepy, but this, the devil's not something that's not trying to scare her away, but he's trying to seduce her into disobeying God. And the devil uses, you know, words that are kind of delightful, words that are meant to arouse her curiosity. And that's how the seduction happens in the, in the, in the story of Adam and Eve. I think in our, in our own lives, that's really what sin does. You know, sin is not something that we see we're terrified of. Sin is something that we see and we're drawn into it. It's something that, that we think will bring us to a greater happiness or it might give us a greater you know, beauty, but it's rather that it's an empty thing. And always, beauty isn't, like I said, universal. Some people see something that's beautiful and others don't see it at all. And so how do we negotiate this? How do we understand how beauty and ugliness might work in our world? Um, Ali mentioned earlier that I was an English major in college. And I studied a lot of uh, poetry, actually. And, you know, Shakespeare was one of my favorites, but there was one other poet that I read, and I just fell in love with his work. His name was Dante, and he wrote The Divine Comedy. Now, who here, has anyone here read The Divine Comedy? A couple of people, some of it. I read Yeah, parts of it. We know The Divine Comedy is about Dante, and it begins on, it's the night before Good Friday. And Dante is running through the woods, and he's being chased by a she-wolf and a leopard, and is it a bear? He's, he's chased by another animal. And he's rescued by Virgil, who was an ancient poet. And Virgil leads him into hell, and Dante gets his first-class tour of hell, purgatory, and heaven. And when I read this book in college, it was just, I loved it so much. And I still read it to this day. I read it every year, over and over again. But I have to confess something to you that my favorite parts of the Divine Comedy are not the parts about heaven. You know, it's not when Dante sees the Virgin Mary and he writes this beautiful poem to her. It's not when he, when he looks at Jesus and the Trinity. <coughs> my favorite parts of the Divine Comedy are the parts in hell or in purgatory. You know, they're the scenes where Dante is describing these beasts, these centaurs, these creatures that are dark and mischievous. And I even love it when he's describing some of the punishments that people are enduring in hell. I won't go into detail because I mean, a lot of you are eating or have just eaten. But they're just, it's so colorful. And it's just like, you know, there's a part of me just loves to, to, to read those parts and just to like imagine them and just kind of play them over my head. It's something that's just it's so entertaining and so grabby. But at the same time, I think it's a very powerful truth. It's a very powerful, it has a message that I think that leads to God in certain ways. So how is that possible? Well, I think part of our natures are drawn to, we're fascinated by things that are not ordinary. Yes, beauty is very good, and we're drawn to beauty, but very often in our lives, we have, you know, the muckiness. We have things that aren't beautiful. And then sometimes we even kind of find ourselves delighting in them. You know, I was talking earlier with Ali again that, you know, I originally wanted to talk about zombies tonight. Because I like the show The Walking Dead. And I know it's, it's kind of a risky show, but I love the show so much. And it's not because I love watching zombies get their heads smashed in, which I do love to watch that. But I love to watch the show because you have in it these cast of characters that are struggling between good and evil. You know, they're, they're in this impossible situation and they're trying to figure out how to survive. And very often they have to make compromises on how to live. And so the show is really, it's about a moral drama of people, and, and very often the heroes become the anti-heroes, and they become these kind of morally gray people. And I think I love to watch the show so much because it does cause me to reflect upon what is happening there. You know, what would I do in that situation? I kind of feel guilty because my sister, you know, she has two kids, and I got my sister addicted to the show. So, you know, she's a four-year-old and two-year-old, and one night, you know, she usually waits until they go to bed before she watches the show. But one night, she put the kids to bed, and she was watching the show, and then her four-year-old got up and went downstairs, and she saw a zombie, and so now she gives nightmares about zombies. <laughs> and it's, it's really my fault, but... But, you know, it's 
something that, you know, she'll, she'll get over it. She'll like zombies someday. But this, with these shows, I think that, and I think that very often, like, even like when it comes to TV, you know, we like to watch reality TV shows. Not because they actually have reality in them, but because they often show this ugly side of life. You know, we watch reality shows because we want to see people throw wine in each other's faces. Or we want to see people argue and cry and break up and fight. You know, we're, we're attracted to that kind of thing. We're fascinated by it. It's that phenomenon, I think, that happens when you, when you see a car accident about to happen. And you can't look away. You have to watch the car accident. And even though you can't do anything about it, you're just, you know, it's just you can't do anything but stare. I think that that's a part of our lives. It's a part of who we are as people. And so when we come to this notion of, okay, beauty and ugliness in our lives and our world, I think those are ways in which we can draw closer to God by allowing us to understand what is truly good in our world, what is truly good in life. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas, who was a Dominican, and he wrote a major work of theology, which every priest has to study, and which I really enjoyed studying, he talks about this notion of how we understand beauty and ugliness in our world. And St. Thomas Aquinas talks about how there's really you say three kinds of beauty in the world. There's the physical beauty. That's the first kind of beauty we have. Physical beauty is the beauty that we behold with our senses. You know, when we see you know, a beautiful painting or we see a beautiful person on the street. You know, it's that, that having a round head and a smooth forehead like St. Francis. That's the, the physical beauty that we experience. And physical beauty is something that exists but not in everyone in all forms. You know, you know, even though you might think that your favorite actor or actress looks beautiful, they have imperfection. No one has, you could say, the perfect image, the perfect body, the perfect, you know, beauty in them. But they have traces of it. They have degrees of beauty within them. But this kind of physical beauty is actually the lowest form of beauty that Thomas Aquinas talks about. And often he says that the physical beauty doesn't really matter when it comes to the moral life. If anything, it can be a distraction. Like the female saints, you know, they would cover up their, you know, they would try to cover up their beautiful hair because they didn't want to have people treat them differently. And then the second level of beauty that Aquinas talks about is an intellectual beauty. This is the beauty of the mind. And, you know, I'm not a, a mathematician by any means, but I remember back when I was in school and I would, you know, I'd take a class in mathematics and, and you know, when you come to understand like a, a truth, like a, a, tru a truth of logic, and you're able to figure out a problem and there's a concrete answer to it, that's a beautiful thing. Or even if you're a musician, then beauty is something that, I think music is that kind of intellectual beauty where, yes, there's some notes you hear, but there's, there's a kind of a mathematical logic to music that we're able to kind of communicate and reflect upon. And any kind of like abstract ideas we have are even a higher kind of beauty. If you're a real bookworm, if you're a real heady person, then you might appreciate this kind of intellectual beauty in a deeper level. But above the physical and above the intellectual beauty, Aquinas talks about a spiritual beauty. And he says it's this spiritual beauty that matters the most in life because this is the kind of beauty that makes us most like God. It makes us more like the image of God in our world. And he says that spiritual beauty is it's really consistent actions. And when I say actions, I don't mean like you know, me walking across the room. That's an action. But when I say action, I mean action even in the internal sense. You know, when when someone you know, when someone's dating a person and one day they realize they love that person, that's a kind of action. You know, you're you're willing this, this feeling, you're willing this emotion, you're willing this attitude towards someone else, and that's an action that can occur within us. Or even when we make a decision, when we come to a resolution, that's also an action that we carry out. And so, spiritual beauty then is about this kind of action. It can be both in the world physical or in ourselves. And it's that, that spiritual beauty consists when our actions are done in relationship to our own connection to Christ. When the work of the Holy Spirit and the grace within us is able to connect with our lives and we're able to act on that, that moment of grace. And so he talks about spiritual beauty as this characteristic that defines the saints, that defines God. And you know, to give the example of spiritual beauty, 
you know, I think we have to just look at the lives of the saints. Um, one of my favorite saints is a Jesuit, actually, by the name of Miguel Pro. Has anyone here heard of Miguel Pro? Or the future Franciscan? Well, Miguel Pro was a, uh, a Mexican Jesuit, and he lived during the time of the Cristeros War in Mexico. And so the, the government was persecuting Catholics, and he was ordained a priest in Spain, and he decided to go back to Mexico, and that it was there that he would continue to serve the church, that he continued to be a priest. And he was known as the clown Jesuit because he had this incredible sense of humor about him, but he was also really good at doing costume changes. I remember one time there was a story about him where he was, you know, in a house celebrating Mass. And they heard that there was police on the street. They were going door to door looking for this priest that they knew was in the area. And so he quickly, like, changed out of his robes and everything. And he put on, like, a very kind of, like, you know, homeless person kind of looking dress. And he walked out onto the street. And he went up to the police officers and said, Oh, excuse me, officers. The cop or the, the priest you're looking for is that way. Like he actually like <laughs> sent them down the wrong way and escaped. Or he even like would go to the bar and drink with the police officers that were hunting him, and he got to know them. He got to like get to talk to them, and even you know do what we call pastoral counseling to them. <laughs> now Miguel Pro was uh, now eventually he was caught, and Miguel Pro was thrown in prison, and they decided to make an example of him, and so they they were going to execute him. And while, while he was in prison, he was allowed to have a rosary and a Bible. And he would read the rosary, or pray the rosary. He'd read the rosary and pray the Bible. <laughs> he'd pray the rosary and read the Bible every day. And, and so when they took him out to be executed, they allowed him to keep those things. And as he was walking to his execution, they were going to shoot him. There was about five you know, soldiers lined up. He forgave the soldiers. He said, I forgive you for what you're about to do. You know, and I pray that, that you will come to know God in your life. And then they blindfolded him, and, and then they lined up, and they were going to shoot him. But the first time around, every single one of the soldiers intentionally missed, because they couldn't bring themselves to shoot him. And so the captain got really mad, and he brought in more soldiers, and he said, you have to shoot them, or I'm going to shoot you. And so Miguel Pro, again, forgave them, and then he outstretched, and he, he stretched out his arms, and, he, and his last words were, Viva la Cristo Rey, long live Christ the King. And then he died that, that day. And, and it's actually remarkable because there was someone from a distance at a camera, and they actually captured a picture of him with his arms outstretched, holding the rosary in the Bible. And they had a, a picture of him on the ground after he was shot. And I think that that picture of him, both when his arms are outstretched and even when he's on the ground, are one of the most beautiful pictures that we have. Because here, this picture depicts a man driven by his love of God. And this is a perfect example of spiritual beauty in that he was able to first have that relationship with God. He had that awareness of even the work of grace within him. And he was able to act on that relationship. He was able to act on that work of grace within him. And that even the soldiers who were supposed to execute him, they saw that beauty within him and that made them not want to shoot him. And that even after you know, he was died, after he died, there was still that witness that he had given to them and that beauty that they had seen that eventually led many of those soldiers to give up, you know, fighting and to convert and to, and to repent for what they had done. This kind of spiritual beauty is the beauty that is alive in the lives of the saints. It's a beauty that, that we can see even in the harshest of circumstances because it's the beauty of God working in our world, even working within us. And what better image do we have of that also than the crucifix? You know, we just finished Holy Week, you know, and then on Good Friday, I remember if you were there, you would, you would hear the crucifixion of Jesus. You know, that's a long tradition where we stand and we, we recall, we relive, we reenact that, that crucifixion which Jesus endured. And on a physical level, a crucifixion is a horrible, ugly thing. You know, the, 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 the scourging, the beating, the falling down, the, 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 the physical damage that Jesus was, was inflicted upon, upon him were ugly things. They were hideous things. And if we really think about how terrible it is, it would be hard for us to look on a cross again. But instead, we see a spiritual beauty. We see that Jesus 
loved us, and he, and he put his relationship with God before everything else, and he allowed himself to be handed over and to endure that, that, that pain for us, for salvation. The cross is a very ugly thing, but through the grace of God, it becomes a beautiful sign of the love that God has for us. And this image of the cross, I think, is something that has the power to transform us, that has the power for us to see the goodness of that beauty, of living our faith, of living our lives, of, of acting upon love and mercy, rather than anger or sin. And it shows us, I think, what the point of beauty really is. The point of beauty is not to just entertain us or delight us. I mean, it does that. But the point of beauty is to really to draw us to a closer relationship to God. And even beauty is, is meant to allow us to see what the real good is, to see what goodness looks like, to see what goodness feels like. You know, goodness is that, that quality which God is. God is infinite goodness. And so when we, when we live a life of goodness, when we live a life dedicated to doing what is good, then we live a life that is in pursuit of God, a life that, that draws us closer to the heart of God. And in this way, I think even ugliness can draw us closer to God. Because we can see, obviously, in beauty, how things can lead towards God. But often in ugliness, we can see where things that don't lead us to God take us. And I think that's where you know, Dante's Divine Comedy is a good example. Because there we see all these examples of people in, in purgatory. We see people in the inferno. And we see how a life of greed, or a life of selfishness, or a life of envy leads to. And it shows us how important it is to instead turn ourselves towards God. You know, even when I watch The Walking Dead, you know, I, I still think of, you know, the terrible things that often happen. You know, what happens when you don't dedicate yourself to goodness, when you don't allow yourself to be moved by God, and it very often leads to a place of darkness, a place of emptiness. Flannery O'Connor, you know, she wrote short stories, and for her, she wrote her stories, and she wanted to, to capture the essence of the grotesque, of the ugliness of life. She wanted to show people what life looks like when you don't have God, when you don't have grace within you. And her stories were very profound. Her stories were very challenging to lots of people. And she was known as kind of a, a, kind of a negative person. But I think in the end, she had this ultimate goal. She wanted to draw people to know this goodness and this beauty of God. And she wanted to show us that in life, we often look at things on the physical level. You know, we look at people and we think of their physical characteristics. We think of you know, the qualities they have that we like, that we delight in. But then we don't always see what is the true goodness, the true beauty of a person. Then when we dedicate ourselves instead to a life of the spiritual beauty, it's a life that allows us to become more like God. A life that makes us become more like the saints. You know, I, I ask the question, you know, were the saints ever ugly? And I have to say yes. There were saints that didn't have perfect bodies. There were saints that didn't have perfect mannerisms or behaviors. There were probably saints that kind of smelled. You know, there were saints that, that took harsh penances on themselves. You know, Saint Jerome, who was the saint that did a lot of translation of the Bible, was known as a really grumpy guy. Like, everyone did not like spending time with him because he would just go off on tangents and he'll be grumpy and kind of be angry all the time. Saints have flaws. You know, they're not perfect. But, through the grace of God, they still are able to live a life that is revealing the spiritual beauty that does lead others to know God. And I think that it's even God that sees our own lives. You know, God knows, He sees our own beauty. He knows what it is in us that that really draws us closer to Him. But God also sees our own ugliness. He sees our own weaknesses. But despite all of our weaknesses, despite all of our ugliness, God wants us to be more beautiful. God wants us to be a part of His beauty. God wants us to draw ourselves closer to Him. And I think that in the, the parable of the lost sheep, it gives one of the greatest examples of this one. It says, now I tell you, in just the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous people who have no need for repentance. But well, since God loves or delights for us to see that despite our own weaknesses, despite our own flaws, despite our own ugliness, 
that when we turn ourselves to God, when we overcome those weaknesses and we are able to act and to draw ourselves closer to God or to, to move in a way that is beautiful spiritually, then God rejoices all the more. It's this kind of spiritual beauty that I think transforms the lives of the saints. It's the beauty of holiness that's alive in the church even today. And I think that very often when we take off our blinders, when we take off our own, you know, sense of what is good or bad, or, or we take off our own prejudices, we see that God is truly active in the lives of people around us. That God is just as alive in the, in the woman that comes to church who's struggling with her faith, that's struggling to, to believe in God, struggling to make it, as he is with the priest who's celebrating the Mass. The true beauty of our faith is the beauty of God directing us. And in the end, I think that all of our, the beauty, all the ugliness in the world draws us closer to God when we allow God to work within us. And in the end, I think that when it comes to this holiness, it doesn't matter what we look like. You know, when it comes to heaven, there's no beauty contests. You know, there's no judging. There's no comparisons. Because in the end, each of us have known God our own way. Each of us are drawn to God through different steps. And then it's this drawing of God, of us to God, which will allow us to be that true child, that true person that God wants us to be. In the end, all of us, all the sinners, some of them were ugly, but most importantly, they were beautiful. Thank you.
that appeals to people. You know, when you see the spiritual beautiful thing, you know, when you see Miguel Crow, I mean, obviously, I can talk about it. It seems very beautiful, but I think that even when someone is at work and, you know, people are making fun of their faith or making fun of Jesus, and they stand up and say, well, actually, I believe in Jesus. I mean, that's a strong, you know, act of faith, an act of love that I think has a, a ramification of beautiful. I don't know, is that is your question at all? Can we just hear some of your vocation stories? Well, I'll give you this actually. Well, I don't know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard story to tell in a short time, but, um, well, I know, it's hard as well, you know, when I was in college, you know, I, I entered college and I wanted to become a writer, actually. I wanted to become, actually, I wanted to become like a, like a TV show writer, like a comedian. And, and I, I went to a very good school with a very good English department, and I kind of, uh, <laughs> and so I kind of made my life about like, doing my best in school and doing my best in writing. But then when I got to as a freshman, um, I, I got to school and I met this person named Rachel. And she was a very good Catholic girl. And I saw that she went to daily mass all the time, and I wanted to get to know her. So I started to go to mass every day to think, you know, I'll impress her. You know, a guy going to mass, that's like you know, Catholic date 101. But then, um, but then as I started to go to mass more, I started to, you know, not even my own desire, I started to, to grow more in my faith. And, you know, in one sense, I was, <laughs> I was drawn by her beauty. But her beauty only led me to the beauty of God, in one sense. And so, um, and so it was like kind of it was a process, little by little. And you know, and so my, my freshman year, I started going to mass. I started you know, growing in my faith. And then by the time I was a junior, I was actively involved. I'd become a theology major as well. I started learning about the faith. And I also started doing things like I worked at a homeless shelter for a while. And you know, every time I would work at the homeless shelter, every time I would you know go work at the food bank or just stuff like that, it really. It was like I was, I felt like I was more alive doing those things than I ever did when I was studying literature or when I was teaching a class or when I was writing something. And, and eventually I figured out that I might have a vocation. So I started discerning. And you know, it's a, it's a long process. Once you feel like you're called by God to be a religious, that's the easiest thing. The next hardest thing is to find out, okay, where do I go now? Because there's so many different religious communities. And for me, the Dominicans were great because. Uh, there was a community of Dominicans in Denver where I went to school, and I would go there for prayer at like, at like night, like at Compton, it's like 9 p.m. And I would go to prayer, and then afterward, I would hang outside the chapel and talk to the Dominicans until like 2 or 3 a.m. And we were always talking about, you know, the faith, or we were talking about God, or talking about, you know, different things, and it was, and so it was spending time with the Dominicans, I realized, you know, I might... I might have a vocation here, and so I entered, and then little by little, I just kind of became a Dominican. I don't know how to describe it. Other questions? Pious indignation. I always ask the better phrase, what's your musical taste? <laughs> My musical taste? Um, well, let's see. My favorite band is actually Iron Wine. It's just kind of like a folk music. Yeah. Like I saw them at uh, perform a few months ago. It's the best day of my life. Other than being ordained. <laughs> so I like folk music. I like, um, I mean, I used to, what's funny because I used to listen to like really dark music in high school. And like I, I used to listen to like Metallica and heavy metal and stuff like that. But then as I got, you know, my faith started to become more important, I, know, I guess it kind of shifted internally. <coughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I kind of like most. I mean, I like most music. But the kind of music I choose to listen to is probably more like folk music, Mumford and Sons, Young Brothers. Actually, 
actually, it's funny because you know, I mentioned St. Dominic and I described him, he's a very handsome guy. And one of the few letters we have of St. Dominic, he talks to, and he's, he's basically talking to his spiritual director, and he's saying that, you know, he struggles so much because he finds it, he'd rather talk to the senior nuns. <laughs> so in his own life, he was, I mean, there's that, I mean, it's, you know, it's a reality of the case, but I think that that struggle for, to not hold on to the physical, I mean, in one sense, physical beauty, is something that is good. You know, we shouldn't, in one sense, let go of it completely, because, you know, physical beauty is, is more than just, you know, people. I kind of talked about people being beautiful or not, but, you know, seeing like a setting sun is a beautiful, it's a beauty that we delight in when we see it, or even, you know, when we smell incense in church, you know, that's, that's a physical beauty. And so I think that, you know, all the beauties, the important thing is to remember what are they pointing towards, you know, and I think that when we see beauty, when it's, you know, in the world or in the church or in a person or in whatever else or in music, you know, it's supposed to draw us to, to what is good. It's supposed to draw us to what, you know, is uh, deeper to God. And I think that it's, uh, it does its job when we, and that's so I think that we have to kind of let it do its proper job. Versus I think that beauty can also be, yeah, to avoid, let it, avoid letting it lead us to the kind of deception where we think that the ultimate beauty is the beauty of the physical. You know, to kind of limit beauty to just what we see and what we experience here, but instead allow beauty to be that thing that really draws us to God.